Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I would like to welcome you to my series on pedagogy of the oppressed. Now we are now embarking on to our reading and discussion of chapter two, which I consider one of the most important chapters because this is where he explains his concepts of the banking system of education and offers us the problem posing or problem solving method of education in opposition to the banking system. Now I'm hoping that you have watched my previous videos. I have uh, uh, about 12 videos on chapter one, same idea, reading and discussing. And I would strongly urge you to please go through at least some of them. And there are a couple of summaries as well. And you can find all of those uh, uh, the, on the playlist that would come up in a minute. So please do watch those. But without further ado, now today we will embark on chapter two of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I'm not sure how many video recordings would it take, but I'm hoping this is a shorter chapter. So I'm hoping that it would be at least at the most five or six video segments. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will now go and read the opening paragraphs of chapter two of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and then we can come back and discuss it. So here we go. Full analysis of the teacher-student relationship at any level inside or outside the school reveals its fundamentally narrative character. This relationship involves a narrating subject, the teacher, and patient listening objects, the students. The contents, whether values or empirical dimensions of reality, tend in the process of being narrated to become lifeless and petrified. Education is suffering from narration sickness. The teacher talks about reali reality as if it were motionless, static, compartmentalized, and predictable, or else he expounds on a topic completely alien to the existential experience of the students. His task is to fill the students with the contents of his narration, contents which are detached from reality, disconnected from the totality that engendered them and could give them significance. Worlds are emptied of their concreteness and become a hollow, alienated, and alienating verbosity. The outstanding characteristic of this narrative education then is the sonority of words, not their transforming power. Four times four is 16. The capital of Para is Belém. The student records, the student records, memorizes, and repeats these phrases without perceiving what four times four really means or realizing the true significance of capital in the affirmation. The capital of Para is Belém. That is what Belém means for Para and what Para means for Brazil. Narration, with the teacher as narrator, leads the students to memorize mechanically the narrated content. Worse yet, it turns them into containers, into receptacles, to be filled by the teacher. The more completely she fills the receptacles, the better a teacher she is, the more meekly the, re the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. Education thus becomes an act of depositing in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. Instead of communicating, the teacher issues, communicates, and makes deposits which the students patiently receive, memorize, and repeat. This is the banking concept of education in which the scope of action allowed to the students extends only as far as receiving, filing, and storing the deposits. They do, it is true, have the opportunity to become collectors or catalogers of the thing they store. But in the last analysis, it is the people themselves who are filed away through the lack of creativity, transformation, and knowledge in this, at best, misguided system. For apart from inquiry, apart from the praxis, individuals cannot be truly human. Knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention, through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry 
whom human beings pursue in the world, with the world, and with each other. In the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. Projecting an absolute ignorance onto others, a characteristic of the ideology of oppression, negates education and knowledge as process of inquiry. The teacher presents himself to his students as their necessary opposite. By considering their ignorance absolute, he justifies his own existence. The students, alienated like the slave in the Hegelian dialectic, accept their ignorance as justifying the teacher's existence. But unlike the slave, they never discover that they, that they educate the teacher. The rise on the utter of liberation education, on the other hand, lies in its drive towards reconciliation. Education must begin with the solution of the teacher-student contradiction by reconciling the poles of the contradiction so that the both are simultaneously teachers and students. So before I go into explaining uh, what I just read, I mean, let's just keep in mind the irony of this situation here. I'm trying to explain the banking concept of education while kind of relying on a banking mode of explaining it as well. And that's because of the medium that I have to use. So you're not here, I am here, and it comes across still as a top-down explanation of the book, and I apologize for that. But as I said, these are conversations, and the best way they can become conversations, of course, is if you interact with the video and post your questions and give me your suggestions. But I am aware of the irony of this entire project. Now, what I just read, um, you already know that uh, he starts with, I mean, so he built up this entire uh, idea of selfhood, the oppressive nature of an oppressive system, the antagonistic relationship between oppressors and oppressed, right? and that the oppressed need to liberate themselves and in the process liberate their oppressors as well. So that was on a macro scale, right? Now he's bringing it to the education that that oppressor-oppressed relationship is still operative, right? And he starts with, you know, the famous lines that I just read, that, that the education as we see it in his time is suffering from narration sickness. What is an act of narration? A narration is where someone has the role of the storyteller, which is unquestioned, right? And they tell a story. The listener, by and large, is a passive recipient of the story, right? So that is the narrative structure of education, in which the teacher holds all the truths, tells all the truths. The role of the student is to receive that. Now, within that, the reality, what he's saying is that the teacher represents is factual and is static. And the student's job is to receive it as truth, right, and then reproduce it. So the emphasis is on rote memory. And role of the student is absolutely that, as he calls it, as a receptacle, to receive knowledge from high status of the Teacher. So that is what he calls the banking system of education, which is one of the most significant concepts that Freire develops in this book. Now, I do have a briefer video on the banking system of education or the banking concept of education, so you can uh, watch that as well. But this is we reading his explanation of the banking system word by word, so it's slightly different. Now, uh, so what he also seems to be emphasizing is the role of the student as the reproducer of the knowledge that the teacher pours into the student. And emphasis on rote memory, on reproducing what the teacher told you, right? Think of the colonial educational system, the famous minute by Lord Macaulay and his idea of how to produce Indian subjects, right? 
who are Indian in blood but English in their sentiments. But the whole idea behind his explanation of introducing English education in India was to be able to produce people who can do basic com uh, you know, computations and who can take notes. So the idea was that Indians can only have a clerical job, but the education was never meant to develop critical modes of thinking. If you look at India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, these colonies, the educational system that is followed kind of by and large still follows the same pattern in which the teacher has all the knowledge, the students just memorize the answers and reproduce them. What's at stake there is that the student is not learning the skills to think. And there is absolutely no acknowledgement that the teacher can also sometimes learn from the student, right? So the banking system, what he says is that the, at the best, what they can become is catalogers of the same knowledge, right? They, they can like arrange it in their minds, but by and large, their job is to passively receive the instruction from top down and then reproduce it. This is exactly the same kind of situation that he has explained in chapter one, where, stu where the oppressed are considered to be passive recipients of whatever direction the oppressors give them. They are not given any basic intellectual capability. They are, they are assumed to be inert. They are assumed to be lazy, all those things. Now, on a micro level, he's applying the same principles to the banking system of education. Uh, and then he says there's one reference to Hegel here, right? The Hegelian master-slave dialectic. But what he says is unlike the slave in the Hegelian dialectic, the student in this situation has nothing to pass on to the teacher. Let's like dwell on it a little bit. So in, in the Hegelian dialectic, the, these two competing selves, right, consciousnesses, compete, and he calls it a fight to death, right? There is the master consciousness and the bondsman or the slave consciousness, right? Since the fight is to the death, in the initial stages of that dialectic, right, the slave acquiesces to the demands of the master and submits, knowing that if the slave, if he doesn't, the answer would be death. And that creates a relationship between the two in which one is a person for the other, the slave for the master. But in the process of that acknowledgement, that resolution, the slave then starts producing things for the master. And as the slave produces more and more materials, the slave realizes that not only is he or she capable of thinking, capable of creation, but without him, the mastership is not going to be possible. So in that relationship, a top-down relationship, there is a possibility for the slave to learn of his or her own significance, his or her own abilities, and then teach them to the master, right? so that the master can sublate parts of that and construct a new identity, and hence a new identity would incorporate both selves in it, right? That's how the dialectic works. But in this educational system, that possibility for the student does not exist. There is no place here where a student can imagine that he or she has something to teach to the teacher. And there is no acknowledgment on the part of the teacher that students can teach them something. So, right, that's where, you know, that's the crux of the banking system of education. Passive students, right, and an imperial teacher. And no possibility for the students to ever imagine that they can contribute to their own education or that they can educate the teacher at the same time. Now, when he goes to the last paragraph that I read about libertarian education, you know, that's what, what he's talking about is that, on the other hand, in competition with the banking system of education, the libertarian education, on the other hand, I'm reading, lies in the drive towards reconciliation, right? 
And what what is reconciliation in um, Freire? We have learned it so far. Reconciliation between the oppressor and the oppressed is for both sides to acknowledge others' humanity, but especially for the oppressor to recognize the humanity of the oppressed and learn from it. So, so reconciliation is the reconciliation of the dichotomic relationship where one is on the top and other at the bottom. So a libertarian education, then what he's saying is, must move towards this reconciliation. Education must begin with the solution of the teacher-student contradiction by reconciling the poles of contradiction so that both are simultaneously teachers and students. Right? That's where I had ended the passage. So, a mode of education in which there aren't these two poles, teacher and student, in which the students are not absolutely passive, right? That would be a kind of mode of education that would be libertarian, that would be based in freedom, and that would create space for the student to be a participant in his or her education. So that's where we are. So let's read a little more. Uh, coming up is a list of some very significant things that he talks about which constitute the banking system of education. And I'll read it, and then we can talk about it a little bit. This solution is not, nor can it be, found in the banking concept. On the contrary, banking education maintains and even stimulates the contradiction through the following attitudes and practices which mirror oppressive society as a whole. A. The teacher teaches and the students are taught. B. The teacher knows everything and the students know nothing. C. The teacher thinks and the students are brought thought about. D. The teacher talks and the student listens. Students listen meekly. E. The teacher disciplines and the students are disciplined. F. The teacher chooses and enforces his choice and the students comply. G. The teacher acts and the students have the illusion of acting through the action of the teacher. H. The teacher chooses the program content and the students, who are not consulted, adapt to it. I. The teacher confuses the authority of knowledge with his or her own professional authority, which she and he sets in opposition to the freedom of the students. The teacher is the subject of the learning process, while pupils are mere objects. It is not surprising that the banking concept of education regards men as adaptable, manageable beings. The more students work at storing and deposits entrusted to them, the less they develop the critical consciousness which would result from their intervention in the world as transformers of that world. The more completely they accept the passive role imposed on them, the more they tend simply to adapt to the world as it is and to the fragmented view of real reality deposited in them. The capability of banking education to minimize or annul the student's creative power and to simulate their credulity serves the interests of the oppressors who care neither to have the world revealed nor to see it transformed. The oppressors use their humanitarianism to preserve a profitable situation. Thus they react almost instinctively against any experiment in education which stimulates the critical faculties and is not content, content with the partial view of reality, but always seeks out the ties which link one point to another and one problem to another. Indeed, the interests of the oppressors lie in changing the consciousness of the oppressed, not the situation which oppresses them. This is a quote from Simone de Boer. For the more the oppressed can be led to adapt to that situation, the more easily they can be dominated. To achieve this end, and the oppressors use the banking concept of education in conjunction with the paternalistic social action apparatus within which the oppressed receive the euphemistic title of the welfare recipients. They are treated as individual cases, as marginal persons who deviate from the general configuration of a good 
organized and just society. The oppressed are regarded as the pathology of the healthy society which must therefore adjust these incompetent and lazy folk to its own patterns by changing their mentality. These marginals need to be integrated, incorporated into the healthy society that they have forsaken. The truth is, however, that the oppressed are not marginals, are not people living outside society. They have always been inside, inside the structure which made them beings for others. The solution is not to integrate them into the structure of oppression, but to transform that structure so that they can become beings for themselves. Such transformation, of course, would undermine the oppressor's purposes. Hence, their utilization of the banking concept of education to avoid the threat of student conscientia zakao. The banking approach to adult education, for example, will never propose to students that they critically consider reality. It will deal instead with such vital questions as whether Roger gave green grass to the goat and insist upon the importance of learning that, on the contrary, Roger gave green grass to the rabbit. The humanism of the banking approach masks the effort to turn women and one men into automatons, the very negation of their ontological vocation to be more fully human. So if you look at these things that he lists, the, this is the crux of the banking system of education. And throughout that, we learn that the student absolutely has no say in his or her learning process. Now, if you think of the colonial educational systems, wherever they were established, this was the model that was followed. And so many of post-colonial nations still follow that. When you curb critical thinking, when instead of giving the students the tools and habits of critical thinking or exploring their thoughts in the process of education, if you give them mandated top-down lessons and then create a system of examinations that asks them to reproduce that knowledge, then most of their energies will be spent on learning the knowledge and reproducing it. Think of it this way. During the colonial system, and India and Pakistan to some extent have still retained it, 10th grade, 12th grade used to have centralized exam exams that were administered by the boards of education. So what you did was, in your final year of the 10th grade, you took a centralized exam for all your subjects. The papers were sent to anonymous examiners who would grade them and send them back to you. So my experience of that was that we spent the entire 10th grade year doing exam prep, test prep. Now what does that do? What it does is it forces the student to just memorize things that he or she needs to reproduce. There is no room left there for them to inquire their teachers or talk about something beyond the test. Now, and that is crucial to maintaining an oppressive system, right? To have uncurious population so that the oppressors, the top, can manipulate them or use them whichever way they want. And it's not really far-fetched. Look at American educational system. The conservatives, by and large, are in favor of centralized testing, right? want uh, education to be assessment and uh, driven, right? So what do they do? The schools lose their funding if their students don't do well, right, in the centralized exams, right? So if you asked any teacher or a student who are in a system where students have to take these centralized exams, they will tell you they spend that year simply on test prep. And if they're spending that year on test prep, chances are students are just memorizing or learning the text itself, but nothing beyond that. And that suits the conservative political agenda because the kind of policies and things that they are trying to push through or sell to the people, right, 
require an uncritical population, a population that takes orders but doesn't necessarily think about them, right? So there is always a politics behind it. So in the colonial situation, in the oppressor-oppressed relationship, the logic behind the banking system of education was to have enough natives who can do the basic jobs, right? but who do not develop the critical faculties to challenge the system. And there was no attempt during that educational system for the teachers to actually seek out what is the best way the students learn. What do they have to contribute to their own education? So all the things that he's listing here are the things that were operative in colonial education and which still by and large are used in American K-12 system and in the government and some private school systems in the former colonies, right? And so what we also then learn is not only that the banking system is top down and treats students as these passive recipients of knowledge and I forgot to mention in the previous segment, the a knowledge that is completely sometimes detached from their existential experience, right? Um, you know, how do you teach people living in the poorest and the poorest parts of the world the value of daffodils? What, what have daffodils got to do with them? Why can't we have, you know, instead of Wordsworth poem, a poem about their local life, about their local flora and fauna, right? That's the the re education detached from the reality. So the example that he gives over there, Paul gave the greens to the goat or sheep. Who cares, right? What he, that's what he is saying is, but the emphasis is to know those facts that are in the text instead of giving the students an opportunity to bring in, you know, their own interpretation of things, to bring in what they think about the text itself, about learning itself. How does that learning go? What he's also pointing out is that the banking system of education is not an accident. It's absolutely connected to the power structures, and it enables those in power to maintain the status quo. Because if they acknowledge that students are capable of critical thought, that their thoughts should be incorporated within the system of education, then what the oppressors have to acknowledge is that people whom they have empowered not only have intelligence, can think rationally, but have certain valuable things to offer. And if they accept that, then the premise of the structure of oppression is defeated, right? That is what is at stake, right? Um, and then towards the end when he's talking about the banking approach to adult, adult education, for example, will never propose to students that they critically consider reality. It will deal instead with such vital questions. So, so like, uh, let's say if, if we are running an adult education center by the government or whatever, it presupposes that those people who are getting that education have not do not have a lived experience, may not have anything to contribute, right? And it's that pedantic approach to teaching them math, teaching them reading and writing, and hence it loses its purpose. I mean, part of an adult education program could very easily be the teacher coming in and asking these people, what are your life experiences, right? How do you relate those to your education? How can I learn from you, right? It's also a hint at what he is calling at this stage the liber libertarian education, which will eventually become problem-posing education, is the limitation of the banking system of education is that it treats all students, right, as recipients, passive recipients of knowledge, but also as people to, as, as one size can fit all. Right? The only time pedagogy changes is when we acknowledge that students can come from different backgrounds, can bring different kinds and modes of thinking about reality. Right? Remember, the purpose of this education which he is promoting is not just to impart knowledge, but 
to create an environment in which people can learn of their own existence, their own limitations, the system itself, and then learn to change it. The banking system of education does not pose the question of changing the system. That's why he calls it humanitarian, right? It just tries to offer something in terms of education without creating an environment where the very system in which that education is being dispensed can be put to question, right? And that's where he is headed, right, towards the problem-posing uh, system of education. Now, uh, we will talk about it in my next lecture, right? But for right now, I think uh, to sum up, what we can understand through the banking system of education is that it has the same oppressor-oppressed relationship operative there, in which the teacher is the teller of the stories, the holder of knowledge, and the student is absolutely passive. The student has no say in his or her education, cannot contribute. The content is usually detached from the lived experience of the students themselves, right? And the model is meant to keep in place the power structures that exist. And there is no possibility in the banking system for the student to actually reach a point where he and she can assume the role in which their knowledge and their experience can also inform the teacher, right? That, in a sense, then, for Freire, is the banking system of education. So that's all I have today. I hope this was useful, and I will continue my reading of Chapter 2 along with you in my next video, right? Please do join me, and if you have any questions, please do post them so that we can really make it into a conversation. And if you have not done so, please do subscribe to the channel. Thank you. I'll see you next time, and until then, peace and love.